Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Importance of Service Recovery in the Patient Experience. Susan Milligan is the Patient Experience Director for Ensemble Health Partners. Informed by her experience in healthcare and as the mother of a child with Down syndrome, she is passionate about helping healthcare organizations improve their patient experience through empathy, empowerment, and engagement. Gwen Collins has worked in healthcare sales marketing and operations for 19 years. She has recently found her true work passion in patient experience and is thrilled to be helping patients and employees have positive, exceptional interactions with healthcare. And at this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Susan to begin today's presentation. Thanks, Brian. You know, let's first start by defining what patient experience is so we're all on the same page. We have adopted the definition of patient experience from the Barrel Institute, and they define it as the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influence patient perceptions across the continuum of care. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Well, it means patient experience is everything. It literally starts the moment someone decides to seek care, and it doesn't end until that final bill is paid in full. And it's about every interaction in between. And when you're thinking about those interactions, Think about the fact that it's not just about the face-to-face -face interactions. It's about every email. It's about every phone call. It's about every time they're driving down the highway and they see a billboard with your hospital's name on it. Every time they're on your website, all of that feeds into their experience with us. In addition to that, the culture of your organization feeds into the experience. What is your team talking about when patients are on site? Are they overhearing positive conversations and positive handoffs, or are people complaining about their jobs in the bathroom? That has an impact on their experiences as well. Now, think about perceptions for a moment. The one thing you have to understand is that patient experience is not based in reality. It's really based on perceptions. It's what that patient understood, what they felt, and what, what they walked away understanding at the end of their encounter with us. And lastly, it's about the entire continuum of care. It's what happens as they're calling to make that initial appointment. It's what happens once they're on site, including the delivery of the medical care, and what happens all the way through until that final bill is paid in full. And so we have to pay attention to all of it. Now, at Ensemble, we really believe that patient experience is a function of three components empathy, empowerment, and engagement. It really all starts with empathy. It's your ability to sense and anticipate a patient's spoken and unspoken needs. And once these needs are discovered, we empower our teams to make a difference by encouraging outside-of-the-box thinking to improve processes, work environments, and experiences. Team engagement is also critical to our process, and we stress the importance of open communication, initiative, and development. So Gwen, how does this translate into operations? Thanks, Susan. First, let's talk about empathy. Empathy is feeling with someone, and healthcare is expensive. Any organization who develops associates to understand the impact that medical costs have on a patient's livelihood is not only going to have successful patient experience scores, but improved point of service collections. After all, point of service collections are not just about collecting dollars, but a critical piece of patient education on their personal insurance benefits and financial liabilities. Ensuring your staff is properly trained to recognize opportunities that will create a world-class patient experience is the foundation to success. Next, employee engagement is a critical driver of patient experience. The higher the level of engagement, the more willing employees are to deliver an outstanding patient experience. Organizations that focus on employee participation and involvement in decision-making processes are the ones most likely to experience long-term success. And lastly, it's time to realize the power behind empowering your team. For teams to be truly empowered, they must have authority, resources, information, and accountability. Empowered teams excel at service recovery because they've been given the permission and the trust to do the right thing. So why is service recovery so important to an organization? 81 percent or eight out of 10 patients are not satisfied with their healthcare experience. And given that the lifetime value of a patient is $1.4 million, that could quickly add up to a staggering amount of lost revenue. 
Are you investing the time and resources into your associates to ensure that your patients don't walk out the door unhappy? Because, after all, there are no third chances. You know, we believe that service recovery shouldn't be reactive. As part of our patient experience program, we provide in-depth training using proactive service recovery tactics dedicated to improving experiences. The very term service recovery implies that service has failed and needs to be regained. Proactively using service recovery techniques will establish trust, build connections, and inspire patient loyalty. Our definition of service recovery was up on the previous screen, but I really want you to remember it like this. It's two parts. The first part is putting out the fire right in front of you. It's identifying what went wrong and solving their problem in the moment. And we do a great job at part one because we do it every single day. But part two is actually going back and stopping the fire before it can burn somebody else. It's resolving the issue and putting a stop to it so it doesn't continue to happen. And we do a terrible job at part two. And the reason we do such a bad job at part two is we think it's somebody else's job. We think if we reported it, we've done our part. But the reality is, if you really want to get serious about service recovery, you have to stick with it all the way through to the end. And this is where empowerment comes into play. You have to empower your team to use the four A's of service recovery. Now, we'll be taking a deeper look at the four A's of service recovery later in the presentation. But for now, here's a sneak peek. Anticipate to realize a need beforehand giving them everything they wanted before they even have to ask for it. Be intuitive. Acknowledge the ability to show that something has been noticed or recognized. This is also a time for self-reflection. The apology, an expression of regret for something that has gone wrong, and it doesn't necessarily mean agreement. And lastly, the amendment, to make better or improve. This is the heart of service recovery and patient experience. You know, we have a motto in patient experience. We always say, if you can see it, if you can hear it, or God forbid you can smell it, you now own it. And Gwen has an amazing story to share with you about how one of our team members took this motto very literally. A few months back, a coworker of an associate shared with us this amazing story about service recovery that we like to refer to as the incident. The incident took place at a busy, freestanding outpatient facility that primarily serves an elderly population who oftentimes have difficulty getting around. And because this is a freestanding facility, they only have environmental services available after hours. And so, one fateful day, the bathroom that is most easily accessible, convenient, and in the middle of all of the action was rendered unusable. The incident was described as if an explosion had occurred in the, in the restroom and that a terrible smell was causing many wrinkled noses and looks of horror on all the faces of those in the error, area. What were they to do? EVS was not on site and they were faced with the dilemma of closing down the restroom that would cause a great inconvenience to both patients and staff. Not to mention, there was still the little problem of the smell. And then one person, without being asked or told, stepped up. She masked up, put on a gown, and I like to think of her snapping on the gloves and grabbing her cleaning supplies. And she took one for the team. She cleaned the bathroom. What an amazing and humbling display of service recovery, part one. Identifying the issue and putting out the fire from the explosion in front of her. She recognized the immediate need and took steps to ensure minimal disruption to their patients and staff. Now, does the story end there? Stay tuned. Now, I'm not saying that you have to clean toilets to provide an exceptional experience, but there are valuable lessons to be learned from this story. Let's dive into the first A of service recovery. It's all about identifying the issue through anticipating their needs. Anticipating needs creates those personal connections that are so critical to creating an exceptional patient experience. In the story of the incident, our heroine anticipated the needs of those around her probably without even realizing it. She knew instinctively that closing the bathroom would make for a poor experience for everyone around. 
But we really want to think about anticipating needs before an incident occurs, and these pointers can help us do just that. It's really important that you're introducing yourself so you can become a patient's person, right? Make sure that you're offering assistance. Empathy is key here. Patients aren't typically excited to engage in healthcare, unless, of course, they're in your hospital delivering a baby. So it's critical that we meet them at their level. Give them your name and let them know that you are here to help. I mean, really let them know that you are here to help. Offer to be their person. That's what they're looking for. Meet their needs before they're even realized. Be proactive and provide information and resources before they even know to ask for it. You know, hospitals are often very challenging to navigate. And if that's a problem at your hospital, if you know wayfinding is a pain point for your, your patients, have facility maps handy. Invest in wayfinding technology or walk patients to their appointments or engage volunteers to do so. Have you ever seen a patient sitting there shivering? Go up and offer them a blanket proactively. How would they know to ask for one? Just to take care of them like you'd want to be taken care of. And make sure you're following through on solutions. And that means that you have ownership from start to finish to ensure this problem doesn't occur again. I need you to become the subject matter expert of your areas. You have to know about all of the resources your facilities have so you can direct patients there. Do you have a Starbucks in your cafeteria? Do you have a Chick-fil-A? Is there a beautiful garden? Do you know the Wi-Fi password? Make sure that you're using all of these things to improve the patient's experience and give them places they can go for respite and distraction. I also really need you to focus on practicing situational awareness. That means you have to look and you have to listen. You know, we've had a lot of success with our teams just from them observing patients and their caregivers' behaviors. One of our team members in an outpatient clinic area that where teenagers were coming in after school for therapy sessions recognized right away that, that students were often leaning over and writing on their books and trying to use this tiny table to do their homework. So they asked if we could buy clipboards and hand them out so the kids could easily do their homework on them. So they went out and bought these amazing, colorful, teenage-type clipboards, and they handed them out to everybody. Problem solved. And those patients immediately felt cared for and started writing about it in comments. It can be that simple. You know, anticipating needs makes a lasting impression, and that's what we're looking for. Okay, this one goes out to all you leaders out there. Think about creating a customer service culture. Hire associates with a passion for service. Use interview techniques to determine if the candidate is a good fit for the position. Hey, Susan, have you ever asked a question during an interview? Tell me about a time you've had to resolve conflict. How did you do that? And if they answer with, I give it to my supervisor. Ooh, hard pass, interview over. <laughs> you know that's not the person who's going to build a service culture. You want critical thinkers. Hire the person that has a heart for service. Invest in education. Frontline staff needs to be prepared to deal effectively with patients who won't be shy about expressing their frustration. Oftentimes, the situation is outside of the staff member's control, so they need to have the tools to resolve the situation quickly. They need to have permission and support. A comprehensive training program for new hires and existing staff will provide your team with a skill set to use when needed. Thanks, Gwen. You know, we mentioned earlier that patient experience spans across the entire continuum of care. But the problem is so many associates believe that unless they're patient-facing, they cannot have an impact here. And that's not true. Gwen's going to talk about a few critical touch points in the patient's experience and how, that we, how we can anticipate their needs. Listen, guys, this one's for everybody. The first step is to show up, not just every day, but in bad weather, if you had a flat tire or a rough morning, we have to be clear with our teams the impact they have if they don't show up. Address attendance issues early and often. Absenteeism or chronic tardiness affects patients and your fellow team members. Being short-staffed can have a negative influence on patient perceptions of care and increase stress on employees. Our patients should never know that we are short-staffed. Patient experience is based on perceptions, and if we plant the seed that we don't have the staff to care for them, they could perceive that they are not getting the care that they deserve. And come prepared to work. Lombardi time, guys. 
Arrive a few minutes early. Have all your systems ready, your workstation organized, pens, paper, forms, everything you need to get your day started off on the right foot. And keep up that positive attitude. You may be saying the same phrase a hundred times a day, but it's the first time the patient in front of you is hearing it. Okay, so let's talk about schedulation. What is that? Well, it's the starting point for a great patient experience by providing the patient with scheduling and registration processes all in one call. This will save the patient time at the site when they're coming in for their test. They'll receive fewer phone calls and have all of their needs for scheduling and registration handled at once. So if your interactions are phone-based, keep these things in mind when anticipating the needs of your caller. Listen to the tone of voice. Do they sound nervous, confused, or scared? Pay attention to when they want the appointment. Does the caller have a sense of urgency? Imagine that you're the parent of a child whose pediatrician said, your child needs to see a specialist right away. And when you call to make that appointment, you're told it's three months out. Are your teams prepared to discuss options? Can they offer another location within the health system? Is there a wait list option? Are they empowered to call the department for a work-in? When you are onboarding your new hires, are we discussing these scenarios? Education is key. Your teams should be discussing scenarios like these during daily huddle, huddles, monthly staff meetings, and when you're rounding to ensure that resolving these issues is part of their playbook. Come on, guys, use common courtesy and common sense. Recognize the prep. If it's a fasting appointment, schedule it first thing in the morning. Or better yet, ensure your technology is optimized to automatically schedule fasting appointments in the morning. Have you ever been hangry? You're not you when you're hungry. And our patients may not be their best selves when they are fasting either. Think about this. Do they need a driver? If we don't communicate PrEP effectively, patients could be forced to cancel or reschedule their appointment. And that could cause a domino effect in the patient's life and within our organization. Set expectations. Let them know approximately how long the appointment will take. People have lives, work, family, friends, things they need to get back to. Make sure that those expectations are set at the very beginning so they can plan their day. Hey, patient access. When you are patient facing, you have an advantage. You can not only hear their tone, but you can see their body language, the look on their face, their mannerisms. You may be able to identify what they need from you faster simply through observation. See your surroundings through the eyes of the patients. Do they have a child with them? Does that kiddo need a distraction to keep them entertained? Are they struggling to get in and out of their chair or having difficulty opening the bathroom door? Are the lights turned on in the morning to welcome your patients? Correcting these seemingly simple things is anticipating their needs. In an outpatient setting, we know who's coming. Let them know we were expecting them. You can say things like, Hi, Mrs. Smith. Welcome to your appointment today. My name is Gwen, and I'll be helping you through the registration process and discussing your financial responsibilities. Be the subject matter expert on your work processes and facility amenities. Think about the information that you would need or want if you are a patient here. Consider, too, the caregivers that may accompany the patient. Do they need something to do while they're waiting? Direct them to your fabulous gift shop, the cafeteria, the garden, art installation. Give them the Wi-Fi password. Tell them where they can charge their phone. Give them those things before they even know to ask. And finally, customer service. All right, we're talking about money here, so it's really important to listen. Take the time to hear what the patient is saying so you can understand their concern. Don't assume that you know what they're calling in for. Be a resource and an advocate. If you know there's something that you can do to stop your patient from being turned into collections because they've not received their bill, do it! 
Your associate should be able to handle common patient concerns without escalating to leadership. Permission to do that and empowerment is key. Let them own the process. Provide payment options. Does your health system offer a prompt pay discount? Are your guidelines flexible? If a patient calls in to pay their bill on the fourth day, but the prompt pay discount is only for the first three days after discharge, is your team empowered to take the payment and make the exception? Now you're probably sensing a trend. The more we empower our associates, the more easily they can take a proactive approach to serving our patients. Let's face it, sometimes things go wrong. And if we have failed to meet our patients' needs, spoken or unspoken, we have to acknowledge that fact. When you see a patient crying or yelling or sighing heavily or stomping across the room, I need you to be brave and I need you to walk into the lion's den. Because if you don't, not only is their experience ruined, but the experience of everyone around them is impacted as well. Because if you don't care about that person, you're not going to care about me and I will take my complaints home and write about them on the survey later. But on the flip side of that, if you engage with that person who's upset or crying, if you walk up to them and you simply say, hey, I can see something's going wrong, how can I help? I want to help. Then automatically you start to de-escalate that situation and build trust with that patient. And you build trust with everybody in the room who could see them and hear them being unhappy. And they will not take their complaints home. They will bring them to you because you've already established that connection. And that's what we're looking for. Use empathy. Patients really want understanding and connection. You know, there's an old saying, you're not qualified to change my view until you first demonstrate that you understand my view. Building that connection and really putting yourself in their shoes is critical in these moments. I also need you to practice self-reflection. And this is really hard. I have to have you acknowledge if you've lost your love for healthcare. Maybe, maybe you've become jaded and you've stopped seeing patients as human beings who need care. Too often, we're treating patients differently based on assumptions or judgments or lack of understanding as to what brought them here today. And every first impression is an incomplete impression. You know, there's a, a disturbing trend in healthcare that should be a major cause for concern for every organization. And it's that our patients are overhearing our team members talk about them and talk about other patients. That behavior is never okay. If you overhear it and you don't address it, you're just as guilty as they are. Remember our motto, if you can see it, if you can hear it, or God forbid you can smell it, you now own it. So if you sat idly by while they bashed a patient or they ignored them because they thought they were a drug seeker, you're just as guilty as they are. Let me share some comments with you that have shown up on surveys over the past year. Everything was going fine until I heard them refer to me as the heavy set lady in the corner. I felt less than human when they giggled when I couldn't get out of my chair. Nursing students were on the floor doing a push-up challenge in the room next to mine while I sat there waiting for someone to help me to the bathroom. Yeah, I came in as an overdose patient, but I didn't overdose on street drugs. I had misread and mixed prescriptions. The nurses were extremely rude and mean. I had defecated on myself, and they actually laughed at me. A group of them in the hallway laughed at me while I laid there soiled and freezing. You know, if a patient took the time to write these comments, how many people do you think they shared this story with? These conversations are most likely happening in your organization right now, and it needs to stop. Your team has choices. They can change their attitude, or they can change their scenery. Judgment leaves lasting impressions on patients. And when we make assumptions that somebody's overreacting or underreacting or drug seeking without any recognition of where they've been, we damage not only our hospital's reputation, but our reputations. Judgment is real. Let me tell you a story of what happened to me. So my husband and I got married in 2004. And when we got married, we decided right away we wanted to have a family. And we tried and tried and tried to get pregnant, and we couldn't. And we had to seek fertility to have our son, Colin, and he was born in 2007. And when we had Colin, we were told, enjoy him. He's going to be all you have. Well, imagine how surprised we were in 2010 to find out we were pregnant again. We were over the moon excited. And we kept calling this little nugget our bonus baby. And that's how we referred to him throughout our entire pregnancy. 
Well, everything with the pregnancy went incredibly well until five weeks before my due date. Five weeks before my due date, I started having complications, and they put me in the hospital on bed rest, which was excruciating for me. And they said, okay, we're going to try to keep him in there as long as we possibly can. Well, <laughs> as long as we possibly could, ended up being a week. So four weeks before my due date, they delivered our second son, Danny. And I still remember that morning. It was a Saturday morning. They delivered him via C-section. They held him up, and I looked at him, and I said, okay, 10 fingers, 10 toes. He has my chin. He's cute. Let's do this. And then the whispering started, and they took our bonus baby away. And it turns out that our bonus baby had a bonus diagnosis of Down syndrome, something that we were not expecting. And that news left us reeling. And if you want to know the difference between having a typical kid and having a kid with special needs, it's this. When we gave birth to our son, Colin, we had a lot of people calling us with congratulations and bringing us gifts. And when we had Danny, we got condolences, as if we'd just lost a child instead of gaining one. Well, when you have a special needs kid, the early weeks of their life, you have to be at the hospital a lot because Danny had to see a lot of different specialists. He had to go to cardiology and pulmonology and genetics. And so we were back and forth to the hospital very often. In six weeks into his life, we were home. And again, it's on a weekend, right? And he didn't look well. He was really pale and his breathing was really shallow. And I said to my husband, you know, I think we need to take him to the emergency room because something just seems off today. And at the time, we had insurance that mandated that before you could go to urgent care or to um, an emergency department, you had to call the nurse helpline. And if you didn't call the nurse helpline, it wasn't going to be covered. Well, health care is expensive, so you call the line. So I called the nurse helpline. I explained what Danny looked like and what he sounded like and what my fears were. I laid it all on the line for this nurse. And I still remember what she said to me. She said, oh, Susan, babies. You know, you think Danny should breathe like Colin. Colin's a typical kid. Danny has Down syndrome. He breathes differently. Everything you said sounds like he's just coming down with a cold. There's no need to take him anywhere tonight. Just bring him into the office on Monday and we'll take a look. And I hung up the phone feeling incredibly defeated, right? Like I've been with him every second since conception. I know my own son. I can tell that something's wrong. And so I told my husband, I was like, you know, I'm just going to stay in his room tonight and watch him. So I literally pulled up a chair next to his crib and sat there all night watching him sleep. And I don't know if you've ever watched a six-week-old sleep before, but they are no fun, okay? It made for a very long night. And his breathing all night kept getting more and more shallow. And so by 5 a.m., I was a wreck. I ran in, and I woke up my husband. I said, listen, call your dad. Have him come get Colin. We've got to get to the ED. I'm telling you, it cannot wait till Monday. There is something wrong. And so my father-in-law shows up, and we hand him the baby, and I ran into the bedroom and threw on a pair of ripped jeans and a hoodie, and I came around the corner to grab Danny to put him in his pumpkin seat, and Danny was blue. My father-in-law was sitting in a dimly lit room holding his grandson, and he thought he'd fallen asleep in his arms. He wasn't sleeping. He'd completely stopped breathing. And I'll tell you guys, when you learn CPR, they don't ever tell you what it's going to be like when you have to use it on someone that you love more than life itself. And they don't ever tell you what it's like when, as you're administering CPR, you have another child standing there asking you, why are you putting your mouth on his? Why does he look that color? Is my baby brother dead? It was the hardest day of my entire life. And my father-in-law took our son Colin away, and the paramedic shows up at our house. And we're in the ambulance driving to the hospital, and the paramedic said to me, you look surprisingly calm. Are you okay? And I laughed. I said, no, I'm not okay. I just can't freak out yet, right? I, I have to make sure he's okay first. And so we get to the hospital, and by this time, Danny's breathing again on his own. He has oxygen in for supplement, and he actually looks the best he's looked all weekend long. His coloring is back. He looks great. And the nurse walks in to check on us, and I chose that exact moment to have an epic breakdown. I was hysterical. I was screaming and crying and sobbing and shaking. I could not get myself together. And the nurse looks at me in that state. And she looks at Danny in his crib looking perfect in that moment. And she said, he's fine. Because she judged me. Because she didn't know that I held him in my arms lifeless an hour ago. She didn't know that I hadn't slept in 24 hours. She didn't know that he wasn't even supposed to be a part of our family and how blessed we were to have him. She judged me based on what she saw in that one moment in time. And the reason I share that story with you is that happened 10 years ago. 
and I can still feel it like it was yesterday. What kind of stories are people telling about you? Because they're telling stories. Don't think for a second that they're not. And you don't want that to be your story. You want your story to be, he held my hand when I was scared. She called my friend so I didn't have to be alone. They brought me a warm cup of coffee on the coldest day of my life. Those are the stories you want to have told about you, not one that still brings tears to somebody's eyes 10 years later. And here's the thing. You get to decide what kind of stories they're going to tell. Are you going to lead with judgment? Are you going to lead with empathy? Make the right choice. That's a great point, Susan. You get to decide what kind of stories they're going to tell. And one of our leader tips is to model behavior. And just like patients are watching us, your team is watching you. So be sure you're modeling the expected behaviors. Recognize excellent customer service. If you truly want your employees to deliver exceptional customer care, reward them. And while your thoughts may automatically turn to monetary rewards, don't underestimate the power of verbal praise and recognition. Having a reward system in place will not only inspire your team to deliver positive experiences, but motivate them to resolve service failures when they arise. I cannot stress enough how important it is to spend time with your team so you can observe their behaviors and provide in-the-moment coaching. You should be celebrating those moments when they've had a big win and guiding them to better behaviors when they've had a service failure. Thanks, Gwen. Now, let's talk about apologies. You know, they're not really meant to change the past. They're meant to change the future, which takes us right into part two of service recovery, resolving the issue. Yep, so now that we've identified the issue, it's time to break it down. When looking for resolution, the apology is a critical step to establishing trust and building connection. Let's review a few key points when issuing an apology. First, be sincere. If something has gone wrong and an apology is in order, you can sincerely say, I'm sorry, that isn't the experience that we want you to have. What can I do to make it better? Saying I'm sorry means that you care and begins to build the bridge of connection. It does not mean that you caused the problem, nor is it an admission of guilt. All right, and this one's really important. Don't throw others under the bus. Remember, in part one, anticipate. It's our job to determine root cause and follow through on solutions. If there's a known issue with the process and we've not done anything to fix it, we are equally responsible for the problem. And come on, guys. Don't overshare. Our burdens should not be the patient's burdens. Perceptions are everything. We had a CFO share with us recently the story of her friend who was a patient at her facility. This patient had checked in for her appointment and was waiting to be taken back for her test. And while she was waiting, she could see that the department was extremely busy. And so her appointment time came and went but she wasn't too concerned because she could see they were working hard to get their patients back to the appointments. And finally, after some additional time had passed, an associate approached her and said, oh my, you're still waiting? I'm sorry, we forgot all about you. Who even says that? In that moment, the patient's perception changed from that of grace to anger. We changed her perception because we overshared. Choose your words wisely. All we had to say in that moment was, I'm so sorry for your wait. Let's get you back to your appointment right away. But see, how are your associates going to know how to handle those situations if you're not talking about them? If you're not providing feedback every single day on when things are said really well and when they're said completely wrong, we have to build a culture of feedback. You should be sharing what the team is doing. These scenarios that we're talking about have to be shared. Your patient experience comments have to be shared. Share the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Ask your team how we can change future patient perceptions. Make sure that that feedback is a, is a balance of positive and constructive. And as leaders, you're a role model. Don't dish it if you're not able to take it. So make sure that you're asking for and receiving feedback in a positive way as well. 
Empower your team. You're going to hear us say this all day long. Give them the freedom and ability to make decisions and honor the commitments we're asking them to make to patients. Empowering staff to handle service recovery issues rather than referring them to other departments can reduce delays and patient frustration. Nobody wants to be bounced around. Give them clear instructions and the confidence to employ service recovery techniques. Help them with scripting to build the connection with the patient. And give them permission to apologize to the patient without accusing them of having done something wrong. Understand that empowerment also feeds engagement, which in turn improves work effect effectiveness. And remember, the apology builds the bridge to the amendment. Here's the thing. You can apologize over and over and over again, but if your actions don't change, the words are meaningless. It's time to resolve the issue. The amendment is the heart of service recovery and of patient experience. It's you putting out the fire once and for all. It's time to end this pandemic. And no, I'm not talking about COVID. It's time to end the business pandemic of it's not my job. Make sure your team understands the difference between a job and a role. When we talk about patient experience, we always say patient experience is everyone's responsibility. It's everyone's job to ensure that our patients have outstanding interactions with our organization at every touch point. Whether you're an executive or an associate, in pre-access or billing, your job is to contribute to the company goal of providing our patients with a positive experience. However, everybody fills a different role in making that happen. So, for example, if you're a patient access representative, your role is to register patients. But wayfinding could be really difficult at your facility, so you might be asked to escort a patient to their appointment. And while escorting a patient is not part of your defined role, it is your job to ensure the patient's needs are met and to uphold the goal of providing exceptional patient experience. It's really important to understand that you may be asked to use your skill set outside of your role to contribute to the success of your organization. And here's how you're going to do it. Be informed. Ask patients how they would like these issues to be resolved. Collaborate with your family advisory council. Ask the team what's trending and what their suggestions are. They are the subject matter experts. They have their ear to the ground every single day in the departments. They know what patients are asking about, what they're complaining about, and what they want. Take action. Do not let the patients leave unhappy. Solve everything you possibly can in the moment, or at least provide a timeline for having it resolved. Please make sure you're executing. We do a lot of talking and not a lot of execution. Make those process improvements. Implement the fix. It's our job to see it through to ensure that the same issue doesn't happen again and again. And if we are recovering a service failure, a patient might give us a second chance, but as Gwen said earlier, we may not get a third one. Communicate. Share your organization's success by posting information on social media. Display patient testimonials on digital signage in your waiting areas. Publish things in articles and share those things with your frontline staff. You should always be talking about the wins of the organization. Having your team be in the know of all of our community efforts just makes them stronger in their ability to be a subject matter expert and communicate that to the patients. Not only is this going to help you make amends when you need to, but remember part one, it also is going to help you anticipate their needs to assist in the prevention of future service failures. Throughout this presentation, we've been sharing the importance of your teams having the tools and resources they need to do their job and practice service recovery. We can accomplish this through the use of engagement advisory groups, or EAGs as we like to call them. These are associate-led groups that focus on process improvement and boosting morale. Frontline staff can provide invaluable insight on where service failures are likely to occur. Having an associate-led team dedicated to continuous improvement is an amazing way to be proactive with service recovery and improve employee engagement. Engaged employees are more likely to deliver better service the first time and utilize recovery tactics if needed. Now, I bet you're dying to know what happened with the story of the incident. <laughs> Did it end after part one? Nope. Let me tell you what happened. We've mentioned throughout the importance of feedback, right? We've been talking about how you have to let your teams know when they did something well and when they did something that you have to improve. If we don't acknowledge this associate who did this extraordinary thing, how is she going to know how much we appreciated it and that we want her to keep modeling those behaviors? So I decided to drive out there. That facility was only an hour from my house. Um, of course, I had to bring a gift, right, to the person who would glove up and tackle an explosion like that. 
please note the poop emoji in that basket up there. I couldn't resist, right? Who could? When I met this associate, after thanking her for such an amazing act of service recovery, I had to ask, what happens if this happens again? Are you prepared to glove up every single time? And her, her answer confirmed the culture of accountability we've created is working. She said, oh my gosh, no, I really don't want to have to clean the bathroom again. I contacted EVS and I explained what happened, and I asked if we could set up a hotline that would dispatch somebody from the main hospital up to this site in the event that it ever happened again, and they said yes. And so then I emailed everybody on the team who works at this facility so they knew what to do if it ever happened again. That's part two of service recovery. Notice she didn't say, I told my boss to fix it, right? She called EVS on her own. She didn't ask for permission. She just took action. She owned it all the way through to the end. Don't you want associates like that? In healthcare, service recovery can cover a multitude of issues that range across the continuum of care. From the time of scheduling to wait times and registration and all the way through to billing and payment, any disruption to the patient's expectation of care versus the delivery of care can create a situation where they become unhappy or dissatisfied. It is critical that we employ proactive techniques to get things right the first time. However, there are times when the, de when the delivery of service fails. We are human after all. These failures, when handled appropriately, are opportunities to establish trust, build a deeper connection, and inspire loyalty with our patients. You know, studies have shown that a successful service recovery can not only restore a dissatisfied customer to a state of satisfaction, but can also make him more committed to the service provider. If you remember, the lifetime value of a patient is $1.4 million. It's time to make the investment in doing it right the first time and having them come back. Let's open it up to some Q&A. Thank you so much, Susan and Gwen, for that great presentation. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. So the first question here is, the attendee asked, there is obviously a focus on healthcare here, but how do you anticipate needs in other areas? You know, that's a great question. I. I work with a lot of friends, and I, I work with a lot of people, and I have a lot of friends outside of healthcare. And um, I, I know one of my friends is a wellness trainer, and so we were talking about anticipating needs of, of his clients, right? And one of the things that they do, and they do it really well, is when they're planning events for these vets, for these veterans, they're planning them at a multitude of times throughout the day, right? So they have some early morning events, they have some midday, they have some evening events, they have some weekdays, some weekend events. And so that's one of the ways they're anticipating the needs. And not everybody can make it at one set time every single every single day. And so you want to make sure you're accommodating to their schedules. The other thing that they do, and they do it really well, is that they're already putting out adaptive um, options for challenges. So if you're doing a 100-mile run challenge, they're doing adaptive for people who might not be able to run 100 miles. And so that you might be able to walk, or you might be able to wheel, or you might just do some sort of exercise for X amount of minutes. And so I like that they're looking at it from the standpoint of this isn't going to fit everyone. How can we make it fit for everyone, though? You know? And so that's kind of what we're looking at. Well, thanks for that added clarity there. Uh, the next question I'll jump to is the attendee asks, I'm interested in learning more about engagement advisory groups. Can you provide us with an example of success you've had with those groups? Absolutely. You know, most recently, we've had some amazing success with our Speak Up survey results. One of our clients who had implemented an engagement advisory group saw an increase in 14 out of the 16 categories on their Speak Up survey, and some of those categories improved by 10% just by implementing engagement advisory groups. Our teams have really created a lot of process improvements, and I'm going to let Gwen tell you a little bit about some of those. Yeah, thanks, Susan. One of the most exciting things about engagement advisory groups is just seeing the teams really um, come together and mature as they uh, form these groups and they really get excited about process improvements and I'm not just talking about um, initiating smart phrases in, in the EPIC system to make their, their work day more efficient. I'm talking about they've actually made facility type improvements 
Uh, one particular EAG that we have has proposed to leadership of, of getting an automatic door opener in the ED where patients were struggling to open the door. And, um, and leadership has been really responsive. And when that happens, it's almost like Christmas morning, right? You see uh, the light on the employees' faces and they know that they're making a difference. So if you truly want your, your team members to become engaged, you have to give them ownership over those processes and uh, let them run with it. Thanks so much for, for sharing that experience. And we've had a ton of great questions come in. So really, really love to see this kind of engagement. Uh, the, the, the next question we'll take is the attendee asks, one of the hardest parts seems to be the real-time coaching, how to effectively call someone out on what they said, how they behaved. What strategies have you used? So we have a really nice audit form in place, and we periodically just round. We'll just show up at a facility and, and start observing staff and create that. And the important thing that, that we have recognized is that you can't just bash somebody, right? Everybody's doing something well, and so you need to find out what that is and really, and really make sure you're encouraging them through explaining what it is they did well, but then just pointing out one thing that you want them to change. You can't come into a facility and tell somebody, you did only one thing out of 15 correct. So you want to say, okay, you did this really, really well. Next time I want you to work on this one particular item. And then when you come back, all right, you're doing these two things well, and you just keep adding on to it. The audit tool that we have is great because any leader can use it when they're rounding, just day-to-day -day rounding, and then we use it when we come on site. And you can give a copy to the associate as well so they know what they're working toward. And I'll just chime in here too. One of the things, one of the techniques that I like to use when um, I was – involved in operations was I would sit with my representative and say, tell me what you think you did really well and tell me what you think you could have done better. And so um, having them do that self-reflection and kind of analyze through uh, the conversation that they had, it's not, you know, putting them on the spot. It's getting them to change their their mindset and change their way of thinking. So I really I really found that technique useful. Excellent. Uh, definitely very helpful to, to hear that. Uh, the, the next question we'll take is the attendee asks, service recovery is so important, but to what level do you recommend we promote this service to your patients and the overall community proactively? So I think what you want to promote to patients and to the community is that we don't want anybody to leave unhappy. Um, it's not necessarily saying, gosh, if you're unhappy, we're going to give you something. That's not the message we want to put out. But what we want to do is arm our team with tools, um, you know, coupons or the ability to give somebody, you know, a drink um, or a blanket and, and resources so they know how they can solve those in the moment. I think the message you'd really want to put out to the community and to the patients is that please don't leave unhappy. Here's who you can contact when you're on site so we can resolve that in the moment because your experience is so critically important to us. We don't want anybody to go away unhappy. Please give us the opportunity to fix it. Thanks for that added clarity there. Um, the next question then is the attendee asks, is apologizing always the best option? Is there ever an issue where if you apo you're apologizing, you may be admitting fault prior to investigating an incident? I think it's really just you have to be careful about what your words are, right? Gwen had said, choose your words wisely, right? And I always tend to fall between something that's neutral. And my, my go-to is, I'm so sorry you're having this experience. That's not the kind of experience we want you to have. Or I'm so sorry we're not meeting your expectations today. What can we do right now to help? You know, so I avoid um, saying, I'm so sorry X, Y, or Z happened. Um, it's really just a, a blanket general statement, and it's really the sincerity in your voice that makes the apology. Um, anybody can say, yeah, I'm sorry, but that isn't the same as, I'm really sorry that that's happening to you. And then I know Gwen has something she wants to add there. Yeah, and I think, too, it's important to remember that you're – to Susan's point, that you're not saying, ooh, I'm sorry, our EVS team is terrible and this room is so dirty. You don't want to throw your fellow departments and team members under the bus. If somebody's complaining about something, you can say, oh, tell me what happened so I can look into it and find out what happened. And you're still building that bridge of connection without admitting fault. Some really, really helpful advice there about uh, communication strategies and approaches. 
Uh, the next question begins with, quote, unquote, we're short staffed today. Uh, any advice how to curb this communication from the front line? Is it better to address by individual or as a group? Perhaps is a combination of the two strategies the way to go? Um, well, I, I would say a combination of the two strategies. First, you have to let your team know what the expectation is. I have found that nobody really sets out to disappoint us. They simply say things because they don't know what else to say. And so that's where scripting comes in. And so I would first address it as a team. And then if you continue to hear a specific staff member, then you, you go on to the one-on-one -on -one coaching with that. But make sure you're giving them words to say. All they have to say is, I'm so sorry for your wait. You know, they don't have to say, I'm so sorry for your wait. Five people called in again today. You know, and so it's really just giving them the tools on what to say and then letting them make it their own that will make it successful. Excellent. And we'll jump right to the next question here. So the attendee says, I hear the importance of hiring fit for of service-centric staff. What steps would you recommend for training or retraining of current staff to help change the culture toward one of service? So my thoughts on that would be that, honestly, it has to be an organization-wide change because if you change it in silos, it's, you're not going to have the effect or the impact that you're hoping for. So my preference would be that organizationally, we, we require everyone from EVS to protective services to patient access to nursing to physicians to attend the same type of training and actually attend them together, not in groups, but like in departments. So everybody from ED goes and they go together so they can see how EVS might manage something and how a physician manages something and it just sort of builds those teams. And then it would go into like departmental training rather than doing it. But it really has to come top down organization. But if you can't have that, if you can't make that happen, and that happens a lot, then really just re-engage your entire staff and get them the education that they need. Because again, I don't feel like they're setting out to disappoint us. I feel sometimes they don't know the expectation. And so we have implemented a mandatory training that's an introduction to patient experience and service recovery that every new hire at our company is required to attend within their first 30 days. And that just lays the expectation for everyone across the board, no matter what level you are, on what our goals are and what our expectation, expectations of behavior are. And just by doing that, it makes the coaching, the one-on-one -on -one coaching easier because now everybody's gotten the same message, they know the same standard, and addressing that make, is easier to do. And I think, too, to piggyback on what Susan is saying, you have to have that culture of accountability as well. So you can do training all day long, but if there's no inspection of your expectations, how do we know our team is performing to the to the standards that we want. So, um, you know, of course you want to do the training and you start building that culture, but you also have to uh, be open to feedback and, um, you know, routinely round with your team, ensure that they're doing and modeling the behaviors that you expect them to do. So, so this next question then uh, directly gets to sort of the, the cultural change of, of accountability. So the attendee asked, how do you approach a culture change of having accountability with a seasoned group of staff, a group that may be stuck in their ways and may have lost that, quote, unquote, heart for healthcare? So our, we call our training kind of a refresh that we do because if you, you have to give them something that makes them feel why they chose healthcare to begin with. And so if you can get them into a room and, ha and share the comments, right, share patient, patient testimonials, that are heartbreaking, right, that are both positive and negative and, and really speak to what's going on, I think that helps sort of break down that barrier that they have built up and they're leading with sympathy more than empathy. And, and so I think that's probably the first step. I think, I think the other thing is you have to, again, lay that expectation because if you've allowed them to have these poor behaviors all this time, you can't come out of the gate just you know, holding them accountable. You have to let them know, gosh, we're, you know, we're changing our standard of care and this is what we want going forward. I want to make sure everybody understands what that looks like and what that sounds like and here are the consequences if we don't deliver on that. I think you have to be very forward in what you're telling them about. Yeah, and, I'll, and I will chime in and draw on my time um, managing operations. You know, don't shy away from those difficult conversations. If you notice that you have a seasoned team member who is stuck in their ways and may have lost their heart for healthcare, 
have that conversation with them. Say, hey, I noticed that your tone of voice or, you know, your attitude or your actions or, or whatever that may be has, has changed. You know, what's going on with you? What's, what's happening? And then I use this question with some of my former team members um, several times. I asked them, I said, what brings you to work every day? What drives you to answer 35 calls in an hour and keep that upbeat, positive, um, you know, attitude? Really ask them what motivates you. And you may find that um, your, their answers surprise you and you may see a renewed love for the job that they are in. Yeah, and to Gwen's point, it's really hard to provide feedback or accountability if you don't have a relationship with that person. So if you're not spending time with your team, if you're not consistently observing them doing things well and doing things you know, not as great as we'd like for them to do, then it's harder for them to take that feedback from you and it's harder for you to hold them accountable. So you really have to take the time to, to be with your team and observe them and celebrate the wins and correct the, the poor behavior. Thank you both for, for tackling that one. As we approach the end of our, our time here, uh, we'll, we'll probably just have a few more minutes, so uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, the next one I'll throw out there is the attendee asked, what are your thoughts about measuring things like what percentage of patients who turned in negative feedback had service recovery and how long it takes for service recovery to be completed? I mean, I think any time you can you can provide measurements like that, I think it's I think it's always a great idea. You have to understand patient experience is based on perceptions, right? And so just because there's a negative comment doesn't necessarily mean that something was broken or even went wrong. It could be a perception issue. So what we have found really helpful is when you're sharing those comments and you're trending them, and you should really be looking at comments, you know, every couple weeks, um, and not just the comments that are for your, you know, for the nurses or for patient access but the comments for the entire department because patients are going to write about whatever they want to write about anywhere. They're not going to keep it in the section that we tell them to keep it in. But when you're reading those comments and you're trending them out, the question should be, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple things. One, if you get a negative comment, you have to investigate. You cannot just assume that the patient was right and that everything they said is right. So you have to give associates sort of the benefit of the doubt and assume positive intent. Because again, just because a patient's perception is it went that way doesn't mean that that was reality. So what we have to work toward then is changing their perception, and that could be that we have to tweak our behavior. So having those conversations one-on-one -on -one with someone who received a complaint is really important. But then as a team, sharing, you know, this is how many negative comments we had, and here's what was trending, how can we change their perception on that is equally important too. Um, you know, if you're looking like Press Ganey, for instance, when they do their surveys and they list them as positive, negative, or neutral, sometimes the neutral are actually positive and sometimes the, they're negative and, and vice versa because they're basing them on words. And it's not until you really read them that you know which one they fall into. So if you're going to trend them, make sure you're actually reading them and you're sort of bucketing them yourself to make sure you're getting an accurate reading. But, you know, I think measuring them and tracking them is a great idea and talking about what can be used for service recovery because I think sometimes we think patients want one thing, but they don't. And so that's where you, it comes into asking, you know, what would have made this better? What would you expect if this service failure happened to you? And you can engage a family advisor group for that. And I think, too, to address the, the, what I think is the second part of the question is, if you have a response time of 24 or 48 business hours or whatever that is, make sure you're sticking to that. If you tell the patient, I'm going to get back to you in 48 hours or, or two business days, that you do it. Even if you don't have an answer, you may, some, some issues may take a little bit longer to investigate, but if you don't have an answer, make sure you follow through and let that patient know, hey, I, I, we have not reached a resolution yet, but um, I'm still working on it. I just wanted to let you touch I wanted to touch base and let you know where we were with this. Absolutely. Excellent. And you, we are about out of time here, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Susan and Gwen, you did such a wonderful job uh, with a great presentation and, and tackling all these questions. And thanks to our, our wonderful attendees for all this engagement. Uh, I also want to thank Ensemble Health Partners for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.
Thank you.